Welcome to Kingdom Perspective Broadcast, the teaching ministry of Dr. David Ogaga. We believe that this message is going to open up the seals and cause you to have a deeper revelation into the Word of God that will make you see beyond the letters in the Word. Here is Dr. David. We thank you. We give you praise. Once again, we're here. We ask the God of glory for instructions, revelation of your word, your mind, your intent, or your purposes. Grant us grace to receive these instructions that we may grow thereby. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, so we are going to continue with our study on the street of gold, and this is part number three. Uh, I'm supposing we're going to be ending this subject on this part. I just hope we'll be able to do that. Okay, so our main text again remains Revelation 21, reading from verse number one and two, ten and eleven, and verse twenty-one. So. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, a door for her husband. Go to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Verse 11. Having the glory of God and a light was as like unto his stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Verse 21. And had his great wall high and had twelve gates. And the twelve piers were every several gates that was of one pier. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Amen. Now, this is what we'll be dealing with, and uh, as much as possible, try to explain to you. Come and take this away from you. I've explained to you that this is talking about the Lamb's wife, which has to do with Jesus Christ. And the Lamb's wife, like we know, is the church. The Lamb's wife is the church. The Lamb is Christ. And I try to make you understand that the bride of the Lamb, that is the church, is where you find the street of gold. So then, the street of gold are a people and not some physical location that you can die and go to tomorrow. Or that will end up be your reward when you leave this earth. That is not what Street of Gold is all about. I gave you a corresponding scripture from Isaiah 51. We can go back there. Verse 22. Isaiah 51, verse 22. Thus saith the Lord thy God. I pleaded the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of the hand the cup of trembling, even the dread of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Verse 23. But I will put it in the hand of them that afflicted thee, which have said to their soul, 
Bow down that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as a ground and at the streets to them that went over. And I try to make you understand that this speaks of a conquering system. Like the Eastern understanding of parables, I try to give you some scriptures from the book of Joshua, the book of, you know, when a king is conquered, or when a king conquers the people, what it used to prove that they've conquered the people, they ask you to lie down and they walk on you or they step on you. So it speaks of the conquering spirit. But what I want you to understand is the language used there, which has to do with the word street. Amen? So street speaks of people. It's not talking about some highway in some cities that you probably may go to one day. Praise the Lord. So the people have been conquered emotionally in your soulish realm are the ones referred to as the streets that these people are walking over. And then I try to make you understand that when you come to the place in Job 28, when you talk about the street that have become gold, what I mean, dust of gold, it turns out to be that this is a people who have been redeemed and have put on the very nature of God, which is the divine nature of God. And in that context, they can't be conquered. Satan can feed on you. You remember, Psalm 103 was made very plain to us that the serpent was made to feed on the dust. And I tried to explain to you that the dust have nothing to do with the physical dust by implication because snakes don't feed on dust. They feed on at best humors, which has to do with maybe worms, and all of those things like fish, you know, protein is what they feed on, right? Okay. So I said, when you get to the place where you put on the divine nature of God, Satan does not have dominion over you anymore. And I tried to explain that to you from that same uh, Job 28 verse number 17 or so. But it talks about, by the time you truly put on the divine nature, that there is, actually verse 7. It talks about there is. We can go back there. Let's just go back to the Job 28 verse number 7. There is a part which no fowl know it, and which in the vultures I have not seen. Remember that. There is a part. That's what I'm saying. Go to verse 5. Go back to verse 5, and then you, you just come down again. Verse 5. As for the egg, out of it coming bread and... On, no, go back again now. Sorry to verse number. Let's start with verse 3. Verse 3. Set it an end to darkness. Set it out the perfection, the stones of darkness, and the shadow of death. And then verse 4. The flood breaketh forth from the abundant, and the inhabitants, even the waters, forgotten of the fools, they are dried up, they are gone away from men. Verse number 5. As for the eight, out of it come a bread, another eight turned up as it will, fire. What was the next thing? He said, Then the stones of it are pure of sapphire and hard the dust of gold. Remember that? Okay. Now the six in us said, remember after saying there's the dust of gold, the next thing there is a path which no fowl know it, and which the vultures I had not seen. And I tried to explain to you when you talk about the vultures I you're talking about demonic powers, creatures, whatever the case may be. And the Bible said there is a point in a man's life where the devil can find access to your life. So the powers of the air doesn't even know what it means to be clothed with the very love of God. They can assess your life. They can assess the nature that you're putting on because they were not mandated to feed on that nature. And if you have this understanding, it changed your mindset. 
are still living in fear, living in doubt, living in unbelief of what whatever anybody times enemies or witches and wizards can do to you. Now it changes your perception about life because there is a part which a fowl doesn't know. And that is a part of the goal. Now I go to Job 22, look at verse 22. By the time you put on the divine nature of God, Job 22 verse 22. Hallelujah. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in the hearts. Please follow this. It's so crucial for us to understand. Receive, I pray thee, the law, which has to do with the word, from his mouth and lay up his word in thy word heart. Remember David said the same thing, that word have I laid in my heart, I may not sin against thee. Is that okay? Lay up the word in the heart. What's the next thing? If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from the tabernacles. If you return to the Almighty, you shall be built up. How are you going to return? Through knowledge. Through understanding. Through the word you laying up in your heart. You returning to the Lord. And you shall put away iniquity far from the tabernacle. From the being. That dimension that Satan or enemies were supposed to feed on. It becomes impossible for them to partake of your life. Your soul. Why? Because you're laying up the word of God where? In your heart. And as you do that, you are putting away, I mean, iniquity far away from your tabernacle. What's your tabernacle? Your body. Look at the next thing. Then thou shalt lay up gold as dust, and the gold of a fire as the stones of the brook. When you return to the Lord, you cherish the word of God. What's the next thing you do? You lay up gold as dust. By implication, in the natural as it were, you come into the place where if you take gold to represent wealth, by implication here, you are amassing resources, you are amassing finances that is no longer of value. Gold is valuable. Remember, we have dust of gold, not gold of dust. Gold as dust. And what it really means is surplus. Dust is surplus. Is that okay? You can find dust anywhere. So when you lay up gold as dust, that means, and remember, gold divine nature, that means the whole of your body is partaking of the nature of God. You lay up gold as dust. What's the next thing you see there? Yet the Almighty shall be that defense. Can I hear any amen to that? And thou shalt have plenty of silver. What is silver? I'm going to explain to you what it stands for. Silver speaks of redemption. So when you say plenty of silver, it's talking of constant multiplication of the benefit of salvation. Plenty of silver. Praise the living God. Okay, let me help you now with the use of elements in the Bible. Gold, I told you before, you can write it down. Gold speaks of the divine nature of God. When you read about gold in the scripture, you're talking about the divine nature of God. Which piece of pure character, precious, and rare. If you want to write down scripture, take Isaiah 13, verse number 12. Again, I say, God speaks of the divine nature of God. It speaks of pure character, that which is precious and very rare. That is gold. Gold is not as common as ordinary sand. 
So it's rare, it's precious. And that's the divine nature of God. Amen? Then you talk about Siva. Siva speaks of redemption. Siva speaks of redemption. Remember we read this up your lay up plenty of Siva. It speaks of redemption. It speaks of the pure words and understanding of the word of God. Siva. You can take scriptures like Proverbs 2 verse 4. Proverbs 3, 13 and 14. Proverbs 20, I mean 10 verse 20. Just write it down. We're not going to read all of that. Proverbs 25 verse 11. Psalm 12 verse number 2. What did I say? Siva? Redemption. Pure words and understanding. And the scripture I give to you, I repeat, is Proverbs 2 verse 4. Proverbs 3, 13 to 14. Proverbs 10 verse 20. Proverbs 25 verse 11. And Psalm 12 verse number 2. Praise the Lord. The next element I want to show you is brass. Brass speaks of judgment. Brass speaks of judgment. Let's read this one. Deuteronomy 28 verse 22 to 23. Book of Deuteronomy. Brass speaks of judgment. Deuteronomy 28 22 to 23. The Lord shall smile thee with a consumption. That is if you don't keep my words. And with a fever. And with an inflammation. And with extreme burning. And with a sword. And with blasting. And with mildew. And they shall pursue thee. Until thou perish. What's the next thing you see there? And the heaven. That is over thy head. Shall be brass. And the earth. Is on that day. Shall be what? Iron. This is judgment. For not keeping the word of God. That's what it means brass. So that's why when you read scripture and say. I will break the gates of brass. What that means is. I will open up. I will take away judgment. Even if people seemingly. Have compassion about. So we see brass speaks of judgment. And he's saying where you don't keep his words. He makes your heaven. As brass. And the earth. As iron. Meaning there will be no productivity. When your heaven is brass. Rain won't fall. When your iron. Your feet. Your, I mean the soil under your feet is iron. No grass or crop can grow. Judgment. Poverty. Famine. For not keeping the word of God. Remember when he said you return to the Lord. Job 22. You shall now receive plenty of silver. Remember that? Good. So plenty of redemption. So, but when you forsake the word of the Lord, when you harden your heart against the word of the Lord, well, the next thing that happened, you receive brass in form of judgment. Meaning the heavens at this stage, even if your prayer similarly will not ascend. So brass speaks of judgment. Did you understand that? Then we have bronze. Bronze is different from brass. Bronze is a symbol of sin. I'm giving you a symbol so that you understand these things when you're reading. Like you have gold, you have silver, you have brass. Now I'm talking about bronze. B R O N Z E or Z E. <laughs> Hallelujah. It speaks of sin. I look at Numbers 21, verse number 9. Numbers 21 verse number 9 And Moses made a serpent of brass And put it upon a pole And it came to pass that if a serpent Had beaten any man When he beheld the serpent The brass He 
it. Actually, that brand speaks of bronze. It was a bronze, iron, metal that was used to construct that. So, if a snake beat you by reason of sin, do you understand that? So, bronze speaks of sin. Praise the Lord. Are we there? Again, we talked about thin, like thin all, iron, lead, against silver draws. Okay, let me take a look. At, um, it speaks of impurity of character, as a matter of fact. Look at Ezekiel 22, 20 to 21. So don't follow the symbols I'm giving to you. Starting from gold. Gold, silver, brass, bronze, thin. Is that okay? Right. So here we're talking about thin. We're talking about iron. I already mentioned that. I'm talking about all of this speaks of impure character. Ezekiel 22, look at verse 20. As they gathered silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in my anger and in my fury. And I will leave you there and melt you. You together. In pure character. So God is saying, This is your character. I'm going to send you to slavery. I'm going to leave you there. And that slavery will be the one that purifies you. Is that okay? Look at the next verse. Verse 21. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the misery of. So, sometimes some of the things we pass through are God's own judgment to melt out of us impure characters. We may not understand that they are not necessarily the devil. God will willfully pick us, hand us over to the enemy for the purification of our lives. I gave you a simple example some time ago. You can just read it. First Corinthians 5, look at verse 5. Here was a guy that slept with his father's wife or so. Paul speaking said, Deliver such one unto Satan, they together, for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Jesus. Did you see that? It's not the devil that have I may have need to see this. It's not the devil that have the power to do whatever he needs to do. If God will not permit the devil, it doesn't have any power. When you put on the nature of gold, the devil has no place in you. It just can't. Remember what Jesus said. The prince of the world cometh, but you shall find nothing in me. Did you understand that? The prince of the world cometh, he shall find nothing in me. And that's exactly what I'm saying. So the devil does not have authority over your life. He doesn't have a power over your life. But you see, God can deliver you over to, this, over to the devil, just like reading Ezekiel 22, just to purify your character. So some of the issues we have, which we spend time praying and binding, and yet we're not getting results, is God trying to purify our character in that situation. But we think it's the devil. The devil doesn't have power over you as a child of God. Practically impossible. The devil just like a bulldog. Bulldog tied, you know, tethered by the dog gate, wherever. And of course, remember this, every dog that the owner has knows the children in the house. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? If you understand like the devil, he says it's a roaring lion, okay, fine, but it's like a dog. And he knows the children. Every dog knows the owner. And not just the owner, he knows the children in the family. Dogs don't buy their own as children, except the ones that are crazy. Somebody say, are you trying to say, God own the devil? Maybe I don't understand. Let me give you a scripture there. Let you tell me who this is. Isaiah 54. Give me the, the last two verses. Let's start reading from the last three verses anyway. Isaiah 54, very quickly. Behold. 
They shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Can I get an amen to that? So you don't have fear for those who are gathering. Men who wants to gather for your sake are time wasting. They are just wasting their time. Because the Bible said they shall fall for your sake. That's why when you sleep, you have to sleep soundly. You don't think about whatever. You get up to pray, talk to God. Find out what God wants you to do. Try to find the mind of God. Try to find the bearing that God wants to give to you. Not looking for devils to bind. You're just wasting your time. Those people will definitely fall for your sake. That is what the word says and that is what God does. Look at the next verse. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Who is this? Who again in the scripture is a waster? So, what fire is it? The fire that purifies you. So, yeah, when God said, Listen, even if they gather for your sake, they are not going to succeed. They will fall. Why? Because the instrument they even want to use is owned by me. And I will not allow them to use it. The devil does not have the power to do anything to you except God allows it. Look at the next verse. 17 then. No weapon. Of all that has been formed, that be fashioned, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Amen. Are you following this? So, this is what we're talking about. So, when you read that Ezekiel 22, Talking about lead, iron, brass, and all of those things. Talking about the impure character. Men will not retain the word of God in their heart. Men will not walk by what God has said. When I say the devil can't touch you, it might look strange without the permission of God. But you know that story from Job. That the devil was on his own just walking around about. It was God that even introduced the whole show and said, Hey, come on, what are you doing? He said, I don't have any business right now. I'm just moving around. He knew Job was around there. He knew Job, but he couldn't talk Job because he knew that Job belongs to God. That's what I'm saying. The children in the house is nobody's dog. The dog cannot buy the children in the family. So what's the thing that happened? God has said, Okay, have you considered my servant Job? The reply he gave actually tells you that he knew that Job was there. He said, I cannot touch him when there's an edge around him. He knew who Job was. He knew the protection he had. <laughs> Hallelujah. God said, okay, no problem. I'm going to remove the protection. You go and do that. And he gave a test. And said, listen, if, if, if you remove the protection and touch him, it's going to cost you to your face. Job is going to cause you. Remember that. And God said, okay, try but I know who Job is. Remove that, nothing happened. So, oh, no, this one is just because, uh, you know, just let me touch his property, touch his life and everything, children. And then you see what happened. And that's why the wife came in at the end of the day. Come on, you cause God and die. Hallelujah. But what am I trying to establish? God owns all things no power can in any way operate to run you down to destroy your life to destroy your family without the permission of god and god is not prepared to permit that but god can chastise you by allowing the devil to flog you some time ago that's possible that's what we read in first corinthians 5 verse number five Paul said, send this guy to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. So the punishment you go through sometime in your flesh, you feel the pains, but it's all for your good that you might be saved in the day of the Lord. Are you still there? 
So back to Job 22. So when we talk about plenty of silver, we're talking of multiplying effects of the benefit of redemption accruing to you or coming to you from the Lord. Again, Job 22 verse 26. But then shalt thou have plenty of the light of self in the Almighty, and shall lift up thy face unto God, thou shalt make thy prayer. Listen to this. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Though there's a place you come to your prayer, it's easily answered without struggles. At this stage, you put on plenty of silver. The power of redemption is working in your life. Prayer is easy. Amen? Look at the next thing. Whew. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Hallelujah! You shall decree a thing. Why? Because you have plenty of silver. Multiplying effect of redemption upon your life. And I'm going to spend days asking for one thing. It has come to the place of decree. And you know what it means to decree? It's military men that use decree to rule. Not politicians. Politicians pass bills. Military use decrees. Kings sometimes use decrees. What he's trying to say that you come to the place of authority and where you're saying wells, they are finer. You make decrees in terms of that which you call prayer. Why? Because now you have plenty of silver multiplying effect of the work of redemption in your life. You no longer that dust that snake feed on. You no longer that dust that men mess around with. Now you are a precious divine nature of God walking on the face of the earth. You have a lot of silver on your being, multiplying effect of the work of redemption. You can decree a thing and it comes to pass. Man, you can change your prayer pattern when you understand what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Verse 28. Thou shalt also read in, and it shall be established unto thee. What is it you need? Now, this is not saying the pastor will do that or the bishop will do that. You that are put on the divine nature of God with plenty of the work of redemption. You are the one to decree this thing, and it comes to pass. Meaning, your purpose shall not be disappointed, but rather rectified by God. And in all that counsel and action, God shall give you the light of his direction, governance, and of comfort and success. Look at what he said there. And the light shall shine upon thy ways. Divine direction, comfort, success will not accomplish you. In whatever ways you turn. What? You have plenty of silver. <laughs> you put on gold as a divine nature of God. Are you following me? You are no longer strict that man walks on. At this level, you decree a thing and it comes to pass. And establish and God's light shines on your way. That means you begin to find divine directions on the way to God. Amen. I had a meeting yesterday with some people and one of the persons said, I just remember now, so what is that? He said, this meeting was on in the vision I had and you were mediating. I said, okay, that tells you exactly why you are here. I said, then I, that individual was the person that come for the meeting. This is why you are here. So you have to follow the instruction of what God is saying. God is saying, ahead of you, this is what I want you to do. Light will shine upon your way. Why? Because you walk in the heart. I mean, the, 
the word of God is in your heart, you put on the divine nature of God and there's plenty of silver. You can decree a thing and it comes to pass. And not just that. Light, understanding, success will begin to accomplish that which you intend on. Are you there? Hallelujah. So this speaks of you actually receiving the benefit of your redemption, the benefit of your salvation. So understand this. Once you get to the place of being saved, you, you're walking in the divine light of God, understanding and the word is in your heart, there are certain things you begin to do as an individual, not just being in church, as an individual, there are certain things you begin to do in your life. And life begins to flow. Light comes in, direction is given, wisdom is made available to you. Your way is open. <laughs> no power can shut any door against you. And that's why he said, if I open, no man can shut. Are you following that? Now you're beginning to get success in the thing ordinarily that you were never experiencing success about. Why? You're putting on the divine nature of God, which is gold. And you have plenty of what? Silver. Multiplying effect of redemption. So, this is what God had to say after you come to lay up gold in place of dust. With plenty of silver. Redemption values in your life. Turn with me to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's start reading from verse 16. Hallelujah. Let's start reading from verse 16. Amen. And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be what? My people. I will walk. Where does God walk? He walk on the street of gold. Hallelujah. Now you become the street of gold, so God walk through you. What that's supposed to mean? He passes his mind, intention, purpose through your life. You become an expression of the living God. That's what street of gold is all about. With the divine nature of God, you can express God on the face of the earth. This is what it means when lay hands on the sick and recover. Your eyes become the eyes of God. Your hand become the hands of God. Your feet become the feet of God. Every bit of your being has become that of God. So when you are moving, God is moving. That is straight of gold. I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. Glory to God. God wants to walk. He needs a street to walk on. And that is you. Your language is God's language. Your thought is God's thought. Your eyes are God's eyes. Oh, come on. Is anybody following what I'm talking about? You're moving. God is moving. That's why when you're on the street, you don't think that you're there alone. Just know that you are the embodiment of the living God. God is moving through you wherever you find yourself. I will walk in them. And this is where you care to begin to hear the voice of God. Guess what? Adam and Eve, the Bible said they had a voice of God in the cool of the garden or in the evening, walking in the cool of the evening. You understand that? Yes. Yeah. When God begins to walk, you begin to experience, you begin to hear him for yourself. Praise the Lord. Whew, I love this. I will dwell in them. The tabernacle of God is with men. Did you get that? Then having dwelt in you, what's the next thing he's going to do? He will walk. He doesn't just dwell and remain dormant there. He dwells and begin to move. That is to say, you become the expression of the living God. I will dwell in them. Look at the next thing. Therefore come out of her from among them and be a separate here, the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What's the next thing? And be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, say the Lord God. When you start putting on the divine nature, 
the redemptive purposes of God was the next thing. You know what will become the living temple of God? You are now the street that God walks in, and not just that. Here you're becoming sons and daughter of the living God. So I will receive you become sons and daughter unto me. Are you getting that? Meaning, when you come to this state, that which we refer to as the street of gold, you become the very expression of the invisible God. You see, Jesus will say, if you see me, you see the Father. And Paul will say, be your imitators of me. Even I'm an imitator of Christ. That means Paul is saying, I'm a way to Christ. If you follow me, you get to Christ. And when you get to Christ, you get to God. So Paul was a way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Somebody said, well, we know that Jesus is the way. Yes. But it doesn't end it. Let me read this scripture. John 12. Go with me to verse 28. Let me see if that's what I'm looking for. Hallelujah. Okay, go back. Go back to verse 20. Verse 20. Bible says there were certain, certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Go ahead. Then came certain therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we will see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. We want to see that man that is performing miracles. We want to see that man that is called the Son of God. We just want to see him. What's the next thing? Philip comment and tell it Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. They came knock on the door wherever Jesus was. The Greeks want to see you. That's a simple request, I'm sure. What's the next thing? Jesus answered them and said, The hour is coming that the Son of Man should be glorified. What is the glorification here? Somebody wants to see you. I mean, simple response is, well, tell him to wait. He launched into another thing which looks like a parable. You coming to look for me? The hour for the Son of Man to be glorified is coming. Look at the next thing. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abided alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth what? Much fruit. What's the connection? Like I always say. Does it make any sense? People want to see you, corn of wheat fall to the ground and die. What's the connection? You know what he's telling them? It is because I'm still alive. That's why you are allowing people to come and see me. People are saying, we want to see Jesus, and you are bringing them to me. You are kind to, you know, open door for them to meet with me because I'm still alive. But I'm going to die. And when I die, I'm going to multiply myself into every one of you. In that state, I am glorified. Anybody looking for Jesus, show him yourself. Did you get this? So a time come when you don't have to look for one Jesus. And that state is what is called the glorification of Jesus Christ. The hour is coming when the Son of Man shall be what? Glorified. How is he glorified? When he died, reveal himself, multiply himself to other people. Any man walking the street, they will be seeing Jesus is everywhere. Then he's glorified. Praise God. All this one, we're looking for one man to fall from the sky. That is not scripture. That is not the mind of God. Jesus, remember the Bible referred to him as the fourth born among many brethren. Many brethren. That means we have the same status like him. So if he's a son of God, we are children of God. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? Right. He's only the fourth born. He's a senior brother. If he's a senior brother in the family, we are all of the same family, the same blood. Praise God. Whew. Hallelujah. Let, let, let me show you something here. But did you pick this scripture today? Why are you 
said, Philip, why are you coming to look for me? Why are you telling people to come? Philip, you ought to show them yourself. So when the man said, I want to see Jesus, here I am, what do you want me to do for you? Hallelujah. I want to see Jesus. Oh, which one are you looking for? I'm here. If you have seen me, you have seen Jesus. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You don't need to point them to somebody else. Point them to yourself. And Paul said, if you can be my imitators, just like I imitate Christ, my implication, follow me like I follow Christ. And Christ gets you to God. So Paul becomes a way. You are also a way. Hallelujah. That's why you are a street. That leads to the Father. That's where you are. Look, let me, let me, let me, let me show you who Jesus was. Hebrews chapter 1. Amplified translation. Praise God. Verse 3. Oh God. He is the sole expression of the glory of God. The light being the outrain or radiance of what? Of the divine. And is a perfect imprint and very image of who? Of God. Nature. I just want to stop there. Is the very perfect imprint or image of God. You know what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1? Let's make mine an image after our what? A likeness. And Jesus came and demonstrated what it means to be the image and likeness of God. What's the next thing? He's now saying, I am living, you take over. Exactly the way I was, so shall you be. As he is, so are we where? In this world. God expects us to become the very express image That's why he said, I will walk in them. I will dwell in them. Glory to God. And so, Jesus was an expression of the invisible God. What do you mean by that? It means, the God that you cannot see can be seen in a man. That is the invisible expression, or the expression of what? The invisible God. So, if people want to see God, where do you think they're going to look for him? They see him in you. It's just like what we said a few weeks ago. How can you say you love God? I don't love the man that you see. Why? Because God dwells in the man that you are seeing. The invisible God is meant to be made manifest by us who are what? Visible. We are becoming the expression of what? The invisible God. We are revealing the invisible God. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That is the statement that each and every one of us is supposed to make. In our homes, in our marketplaces, wherever I find myself, is God moving, is God walking, is God expressing himself. This is what he wanted. Not you dying and going to heaven. No. You are born into heaven. If, if, it, if it means when we die, we go to heaven. It simply means we are wasting time here. Because the day you die, I mean the day you are born again, you are supposed to go to heaven. Either vehicle should kill you or anything just kill you so that you go to heaven. If going to heaven is the ultimate, what are you still waiting for? And you still go to hospital to be treated, you still, when you are sick, you still look for doctors to help you. To still live, live for what? When, when you die, you go to heaven. You die. Lots of fever to attack you, don't treat it, die and go to heaven. And if fever refuses to come, go to the road and lie on the road and let the vehicle cross you. Go to heaven. But you know what Jesus said? Our Father, which are in heaven, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done where? On the earth. As it is done in heaven. You don't need to go there to find the will of God. We want to run away. That is not mine of God, people. Can we stand up and let the world know that Jesus has actually risen and the spirit has been released and is now within us and God is walking through us and in us and we can express it wherever we find ourselves whether in the marketplace, whether in the home we can make people know that God is alive that is the excess 
Take your final scripture. Help me, Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Am I helping anybody tonight? Praise God. For whom he did for new, he also did predestinate to be conformed to what? The image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among what? Many brethren. Predestination is, a, is, is not that one day you're going to die in an accident. That is not predestination. Predestin I've taught you here before. The message is there. Predestination means you are conformed to what? The image of his son. So when he told Philip, hey, listen, this is your problem. Because I'm still alive. That's why you want people to come see me. You want the Greeks to come. I'm going to be glorified. When I'm glorified, I become the senior brother to all of you. And the very life that I have becomes your life. The Holy Ghost will be released. Begin to dwell in you, and that's God living in you. God walking in you. God expressing himself in you. Give me Ephesians 2 and the last verse. Verse 22. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2. In whom you also build it together. Okay, go to verse 21. Let's see that. In whom all the building fitly framed together grow unto a holy temple in the Lord. Remember what the Bible says? We are the temple of what? Of the living God. So through the apostle and prophet, the house has been built, which is the church, which is you. What's the next thing? In whom you also are built together for what? A habitation of God through what? The Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. So God dwells in you through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit never came until Jesus went to the cross and they resurrected. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out, God came now to dwell in you. So when he said, you shall be my temple, I will dwell in you. That's what he's talking about. The Holy Spirit now resident in your life. And Jesus said, that is what glorifies me. Praise the Lord. Are we here? This is what the street of gold is all about. Nothing to do whatsoever. With anything upstairs in that which is called heaven, all those saying and driving cars in heaven are just speaking their own mind and their own thoughts. Nothing to do with the scriptures. Nothing to do with the mind of God. God didn't create you to go and drive limousine or drive Range Rovers in heaven. All those are deceptions. Nothing to do with God at all. That is not God's mind for mankind. His thought, he hasn't changed. What is thought? Let's make mine an image after a likeness and let it have dominion over everything that we have what created. Everything we have created. Let them rule. And through his blood, Revelation 5:10, we made prince and kings, and we shall reign where on the earth. Oh glory. We shall reign where on the earth. Give me Revelation 11, verse 15. Mm. And the seventh angel sounded And there were great voices in heaven saying Great voices and many people The kingdom of this world Have become the kingdom of our Lord And of his Christ And he shall reign for where? Forever and ever Where is it any? On the earth The kingdoms of this world are becoming In other words God's kingdom is overriding It's overcoming is dominating, is subduing all other kingdoms and possessing those kingdoms for who? For God. But people want to fly away. You are not going anywhere. I'm sorry, your flight has just been cancelled. No ticket. In fact, the flight pilot is gone mad, so you can't fly. So change your mind. Amen. Just get back your luggages. You're going nowhere. You're not flying. Your ticket has been cancelled. Flight is not only delayed, cancelled. <laughs> You're going nowhere. The kingdoms of this world are becoming. Hallelujah. The kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign on the earth. There's a place for dominion. A place of authority. Hallelujah. That's why I keep talking about. Can you give me 
Revelation 14 verse number 6. Let me see if that's what I want. Whew, hallelujah. 14 6. And I saw another angel by in the midst of heaven, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Everlasting gospel. This is the final gospel. What gospel is that? The gospel of the kingdom. Nothing about sanctification, not about all of those things you look at in Christ, uh, Christ's realities, and gospel of grace, gospel of holiness, God, all of those things are gospel, but there's but one gospel, and that's the gospel of the kingdom, which is everlasting. All of those things I just mentioned, they are all found here. Gospel of peace, gospel of grace, they are all found here. In one gospel, gospel of the kingdom. That's why the Bible talks about the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but what? Righteousness and peace and joy. Where? In the Holy Ghost. Did you get that? So, friends, what am I trying to make you understand? Becoming the street of God is putting on the divine nature of God and allowing God to pass through you in your thoughts, in your decisions, in everything that you want to do. Allow him to express himself, to pave the way, to open the door, speaking to you, show you things that you don't know. And then when you're in the midst of people, helping them out in their difficult situations by the things you say, by the counsel you give to them. Are you following that? That is God ministering to the people. Sometimes you talk to people in the manner and say, this is God who, have you heard that before? This is God. This he just told me. This is God. I've been so confused. This is God. I mean, we must come to that level. We allow God to walk on the face of the earth. Praise the living God, somebody. So what's the street of God? The nature of God. The divine nature of God. It has nothing to do with anything upstairs. If anybody come preach to you that they saw a vehicle being moved in the street of gold upstairs, just know that it's a figment of those people's imagination. Nothing to do with God, nothing to do with scriptures. We are here and we're going to make God known to the rest of mankind. That should be your goal. That should be your purpose. That through me, men who haven't known God, eventually do what? Get to know God. Praise God, somebody. God bless you and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Dr. David Ogaga. We know you have been blessed by this station. You can share this message with your friends and loved ones. For more information, inquiries, and free downloads, please visit www.davidogaga.org. God bless you.